17-year-old Rainer currently sits comfortably in the Grand Finals as he awaits his next opponent. We have a five-time WCS and BlizzCon champion who's looked absolutely unstoppable throughout all of 2018 and 2019. Candy Mala and the former WCS Spring Champion in the Finnish Phenoms run. Please welcome on stage, it is Cyril and Showtime! Time for our next semi-final here, as of course we have Showtime going up against Serral. Will Showtime be able to break one of the most dominant forces in StarCraft II history? Or will WCS be trapped perpetually in an old Mortal Kombat game where all of these nerds fight up a tower and eventually <laughs> reach Goro up at the top? The Whoa. four arms of Serral are about to wrap around Dimawa potentially. Yeah. Gentlemen, <laughs> we are here. How are you doing, boys? Oh, I hope Shang. <laughs> I hope Showtime's Shang Tsung. <laughs> this is a. Uh, I mean, this is a tough one. Showtime has not beaten Serral since 2017. It's a long time between series drinks, and we know that Serral 2017. Even though he did get the grand final one time against me, yeah. he has leveled up a lot since then. So Serral's just been getting better and better. Showtime recovering from an injury, of course. You know, it's been the talking point whenever we look at Showtime on the on the desk here. Uh, but he has actually bounced back super hard. Yeah, he should back. get injured more often. <laughs> He's had an amazing <laughs> show so far. I wouldn't far wish here. that upon him, but I mean, hey, <laughs> he, came, he wow. came back and he looked absolutely incredible in some of his PVZs on stage. Yeah, this is uh, a clash of the titans here in these other semifinals. Like, I mean, we almost couldn't have scripted it better, really. Mm. Like, you would think that with Neeb already meeting Cell in the quarterfinals, then maybe we'd have a shorter uh, shortage of great matches later on. No. Not the case at all. Showtime against Serral here is one of the biggest fixture, fixtures that we could hope for yeah. in the WCS circuit scene. One of the most storied rivalries, actually, in the WCS circuit. These I'm two sure. have met each other 29 times in the past. And once upon a time, Showtime was up 12 and 9 in series. <laughs> Serral won the last eight. So it's now 17 and 12 things in Cyril's favor. <laughs> yeah, things have changed. And of course, they once met each other in a grand final of WCS as well, as we all know how that went down uh, for our Finnish phenom himself. Cyril, just a force of nature to try and be tamed here by Dimawa, but can he stand strong? It's going to be a difficult task, to say the least, for Showtime. But, you know, as you guys alluded to, there is this weird form that Showtime has suddenly found himself in after some weird, weird circumstances, to say the least. He, he has leveled up some. Like that, that first game that he played on stage, he, the the first PVZ we saw on stage, I actually can't remember the Zerga was up against. Is Scarlet? It? Scarlet, I believe. Oh, actually, mm. Oh, uh, was it earlier than that? Maybe. But the, the game specifically on Thunderbird, which yeah. is one of his picks, by the way, was absolutely incredible. He was actually hitting in three or four different places at once. Yeah. Prism in the main, harassing in the natural, hitting the third base with charge lots, yeah. and meanwhile just pushing with the majority of his forces, spellcasters, immortals, that sort of thing. It's just incredible stuff. The multitasking is absolutely insane. Of course, Serral, really well known for it as well. And uh, he has shown that in this matchup, there are some timings where he's a little bit vulnerable. Yeah. Neeb actually managed to draw blood from him a couple of times. Some pretty nice timings, especially when you know we, we saw Serral pretty consistently try and go into the tier three Zerg tech. Yeah. And then Neeb having windows to punish, but you let Serral get enough infestors and broodlords out, then he gets mm. a little bit harder to kill, some would say even invulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. A showtime on this road so far in group stage three, bit special 2 0, and then so far in the brackets, he defeated Scarlet 3 0, and then time 3 and 1. So he's looked really good. And he got a glimpse of what Cyril likes to do, just as Maynard mentioned. Yeah. He's definitely had time to kind of brainstorm exactly how to go about countering that style of Cyril, where he was going a lot for Zergling, Bane, Hydralist, and straight into Hive with those Root Lords. Cyril played in that one series against Snape, even though he looked really good in the other three games. He yeah, did lose yeah. the one. And Showtime is one of those very cerebral guys that can adapt on the fly very well, too. So he's going to need no less than that here and some very crisp 
timings because there's not many of them that he can hit that will work against the Titan that is so. And if our Toby Eye Tracker is anything to go by, it's two of the very fastest players here for WCS Summer going head to head. It is time, ladies and gentlemen, the round of four, the final match here in the round of four. Showtime versus Serral. Let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, we're starting map number one of our second semifinals match. Up here at the top left, we have our blue Protoss player from Team Makers. He is the German Showtime. And in the right bottom side of Thunderbird, we're looking at the main base of the undisputed champion of the WCS circuit, the man who just keeps on winning, representing ENS Esports, hailing from Finland. It is Serro. Undisputed King is already knocked out Neeb, the former King, thereby shutting down any speculation that anyone is going to really be able to hold that crown. But Showtime, he said he was feeling a little bit more confident about this match, which, you know, is really refreshing to see something like that from Showtime. Yeah, he's played super good in this tournament. And you know, for me, this is a funny matchup because I think there is a little bit of uh, poetry, perhaps, to this best of five. If you go back all the way to 2017, the boys at the desk mentioned it a little bit. That is the last time that Showtime ever defeated Serral. Eight this series was, ago. Yeah, this was over in Barcelona. That also turned out to be the very first LAN tournament that Sarah would ever win. That was the European qualifier for WESG, but the first place was like $18,000. So it was a very serious tournament, and that kind of took that monkey off his shoulder where a lot of people said like, ah, you know, Sarah is just a ladder hero. Sarah is only good <laughs> online, even though it was ridiculous, right? He already made a final that he lost against Neep. But that was the very first tournament he ever won, but he lost one series in that tournament, and that was against Showtime in the group stage. So mm -hmm. I think that's kind of funny. But then to make it even more funny, if you go back to the start of 2018, where the rain of Serral truly began. WCS Leipzig. Exactly. And who did he play in that grand final? Oh, was it Showtime? Exactly, it was. So I think it's kind of cool how Showtime was there. He was the last one to really defeat him in one of these tournaments that Serral did win. And then he was also the opponent of Serral in that very first grand final when Serral finally lifted that WCS trophy. Obviously, right now we're like eight WCS trophies further <laughs> and we're very used to the side of Serral winning. But hey, wouldn't it be something if the man who started it all is actually the one who stops it? it all as well. I mean, these two players have a storied history amongst each other, and some would say before this event that Serral has looked the most vulnerable he's looked in a long time, in ZVP specifically, yeah. but I think he shut down a lot of that speculation with that last match. Showtime has had an opportunity to watch that series and maybe learn a trick or two. We're going to see what he has to throw out. So far, he's going for that Stargate opening, going for the usual kind of adept harassment slash scouting information. He's going to shade forward, see what he can spot out, but looks like Cyril already spotted out that Stargate before the Phoenix even starts up, and that means that he's going to have plenty of time before he has to really worry about throwing down those spores. Yeah, Neep, of course, had a phenomenal start on this map with his adapts. He was able to pick off so many drones, and Cyril, I had a little chat with him about these games as well, and he's like, yeah, I kind of thought I was dead in this game. It really wasn't going anywhere for me. He's like, I think I got a bit lucky now. Obviously, in the end, it's, it's not luck when it's Cyril, but there were definitely some moments where his hands were kind of tied, and he did have to hope that Neep would make a slip up or two. So maybe Showtime can get himself in similar positions and actually don't make those slip ups. We will see. I mean, Showtime showed us that he likes that triple Oracle opening mm -hmm. on this map. He had a phenomenal start against Scarlet, like the boys at the desk mentioned as well. And hey, Serral struggled against that style a little bit at Holster yeah. Cups. That's absolutely dismantled Serral in that little best of three they played in the group stage. Of course, that was only a group stage match. Serral did end up winning the tournament, but that does show that there is always hope there is always potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to also emphasize that in that series versus Neeb, one thing that we can definitely take away was there were absolutely mistakes being made by Serral. Mm -hmm. And if Showtime can find those opportunities, he can absolutely capitalize on a lot of them. I mean, I even just think about how some of the series that Showtime played earlier went, where Maynard was actually talking about this on the desk, but the War Prism harassment, the Zealot Warpins, the multi-prong 
pressure that Showtime was putting on his previous PBZs was astoundingly on point. So I'm really hoping we get to see a bit of that today. Well, we are about to enter that phase in the game where Showtime has his Phoenix out and he also mm -hmm. has his three Oracles. And then, like I said before, keep a close eye on these Adepts because the Adepts represent a lot of potential as well. There is a Robo going up behind all of this, so by no means is Showtime all in here. But this is, of course, the kind of opening where you do want to get some damage done. What's the Queen count at right now? Can we take a look at that real quick? Five, five. Queens. I mean, it's hard to have five Queens in the right position against the Phoenix and three Oracles. Mm -hmm. Let's see if Showtime can find the first hole in the defenses of Serral. Uh, the Adepts are already getting surrounded over here. The Shade will finish up and they will get back to safety behind that wall. So Oracles and Phoenix going to le be left to fend for themselves. It looks like Serral's already in position with three of the Queens. Yeah, but he doesn't have much in the main base. He does have two Queens here. There is a Spore. Showtime does not want to commit, but it's only going to get harder, Showtime. I think the main base is your best guess. And Showtime agrees. Let's see what he can get done. All right, he's focused firing down a couple of these drones. Spore Crawler is going to be able to knock out one of the Oracles from the sky. The second Oracle getting very low. Oh. It does get taken out six workers and also <laughs> uh, Showtime loses two Oracles and a Phoenix in exchange. Roddy, probably not the trades he was looking for. No, absolutely not. We've seen scenarios where even Sarah would lose 15 to 20 drones against his opening. Now, Showtime is not done yet. He does find a few more. That makes it a little bit better. Overall, still not worth it. You don't want to lose a Phoenix. You don't want to lose two Oracles for just nine drones. On top of that, Cerro also had a really good read on this build, skipped the Bailing Nest early on, skipped the Roach Warren, wasn't worried about anything on the ground at all, and he gets a very quick Hydra then out. So where Cerro was able to march to the other side of the map, right, and get a very easy, convenient cancel on that fourth base and put Cerro in a rough spot, I don't know if Showtime is going to be able to do the same. He's going to try, mm -hmm. but I don't know if he can because the Hydras are so much quicker this game. Oh, absolutely. Uh, those are some okay force fields. Locks down a couple of those lanes, but remember the force fields are a massive resource for this push. He needs huh. absolutely as many force fields as he can afford. So that sentry energy is so important to reserve. Those four gateways are going to be finishing up. The Warp Prism on its way across the map. He's picking off a couple of these Creep Tumors, but he is diving pretty far onto Creep. Yep, I mean, the real Zealot uh, numbers are not here yet. That Warp Prism is making its way to the other side of the map. But like I said, before, Serra was forced to cancel that fourth base. Showtime also got a very easy cancel. Showtime Ooh. actually traps a couple of these Hydras. That's kind of cute. But obviously, I mean, Serra is quite rich, and he's already producing a lot of these Hydras. The most important thing for Serra here is keep that fourth base alive, and it seems like he's going to have absolutely no trouble doing so. Well, Templar Archives is finished up there for Showtime. Not starting up Psionic Storm just yet, even though he definitely is banking a lot of resources. I mean, 1,000 minerals, 700 gas. So is he really going to start committing to this, given how many Hydras there are? We do see the Queens starting to get taken out over oh, here, but not me. quite dying. And that is a lot of Force Shield spent on not actually getting any damage done. Yeah, it seems like Showtime didn't really uh -oh. believe in the straight up fight anymore. So instead, he's going to try to get a massive warp in the main base. You mentioned the resources, but hey, if you get 10 more Zealots in the main, that's a way to spend your money. But Showtime is like, ah, maybe the fight at the front just didn't really go the way I wanted. So Serral actually survives what is normally a scary and dangerous phase in the game. I mean, Serral passes the test with flying colors, but we do wow. have Storm on the way. Yeah, and there is the six High Templar Warping that spends that entire gas bank for Showtime. So now just going to probably spend another couple of Warpins on some uh, Zealots later on. But we got a Spire and a Hive getting started up. Serral is wasting no time at all. Similar to how we saw versus Neve, he's getting ready to make that transition of Brew Lords as soon as he gets opportunity. Yep, we'll see if he can actually get something done with the Hydras and Banes that he has as well. But Serral probably not going to get super over Oh, no! No, that's not something you want to do. That's yeah. two banelings rolling into these rocks. I mean, he's going to be able to take care of them. A little one-army hotkey syndrome there. <laughs> oh. Maybe just a right-click on the rocks. It happens. Yeah. Oh. Whoa! Oh, War Prism snipe. That, that is one of the two prisms. And yeah. now immediately Showtime fires up another prism. Sets up a massive warp in here, but I'm not exactly sure what this warp in is supposed to achieve because these minerals are still here, so they're going to have to travel over creep for quite some time. Okay, they're going to find a couple of Hydras. All right. I mean, yeah, it's something. Yeah, but at this choke point, it looks like that. Okay, well, the Hydras are going to get backed up by a lot of these lings. A wow. recall out on the Zelsi. You might be out there with four of them. It's something, but yeah. that definitely did not go how Showtime wanted. I mean, obviously, something that we often talk about in this matchup is the pre Broodlord timing, you know, with mm -hmm. plus two, 180, 190 supply, you get that War Prism in there as well. But it seems like that's going to be very hard to hit, man, because that Great Aspire is already morphing. He's I mean, so Hive is already done. 
Yeah, I mean, something like Showtime is going to have to get the best fight of his life if he wants to hit that timing that we mentioned. But I think after what Showtime saw before, I don't think he's super eager to oh. build a lot of Stargate. Those are some really good force fields. The so. donuts. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's nice, right? That's a couple of Hydras immediately. There's a lot of Storm energy available here. A couple of good defensive Storms. Going to make it hard for this army of Zero to chase it, but keep a close eye on the great Aspire at the production tab. Great Aspire getting closer and closer to finishing on up. And Cyril still has this army that he can make use of. Remember, he needs to free up some supplies. So he's going to try and force an engagement mm -hmm. whenever he gets the opportunity to so that he can make a couple of those Broodlords and those Corruptors soon. But Zealot run by from the north side using that prism that was on the north side that Manshiviki remade. We already see that Showtime is thinking about that Fleet Beacon. The Double Stargate's also being thrown down. He has to be so careful with this army, though. We've seen what happens to Neeb when you lose that ground force before you really get the opportunity to make that transition. Now, you have to at least buy a little bit of time. And well, Stasis Trap catches all the Banelings here. That's nice. Yep, that's absolutely nice. Keeps that mineral line safe because we know what Banelings can do against those probes. I, I mean, I still think that Showtime would love to get a great fight, but Sarah was playing a very beautiful game when it comes to positioning his army, making it so hard for Showtime to really make any progress on Ooh. the map, right? He's is just not getting forward. Showtime doesn't want to run into choke points. These Banelings will explode over these Archons. Those are some great storms there on top of the Banes. Well done. But don't forget, this is not an all-in. Serral wants to free up supply, but Serral has to be careful that he doesn't throw away too many units. He's also losing a lot of drones on the top right-hand base, and now a War Prism in the main base. We're a ton of Zealots. The War Prism does get taken care of, but these Zealots are still going ham, and a hatchery getting low. What? Showtime takes the first game. What? Okay. <laughs> I am a little bit surprised by that tap out, Roddy. Not going to lie, even worker counts and Cyril loses one of the bases. And of course, the push does get pushed back, but it was even supply. I, do you feel like that was a little bit premature? Absolutely. I'm, go okay. I'm not going to sit there and be like, yeah, I think that one was pretty over. No. I mean, obviously, I don't think the last 20 seconds in that game were going great for Cero, but with the greatest buy I done, he, he just fired up 68 links. I still think he had plenty of time to buy some time. I think there were a couple of Corruptors on the way already as well. I am pretty shocked, especially because Showtime was building three Tempests during all of this. Mm -hmm. So yes, Showtime was getting ready for those Brutes, and he was getting ready to, you know, maybe at least have an army that can fight the Brute Lords. I mean, uh, Tempests are very slow units. They're not going to teleport to the other side of the map <laughs> and participate in the battle immediately. I've seen Cero make much bigger comebacks than that, so I'm pretty shocked to see him tap out there. That's really weird. Yeah, game one in this best of five, and Showtime getting one of those kind of free wins on the board is going to be a little bit rough, even for our uh, God King, Cyril, over here. So as we move into game number two, now, Roddy, I remember that you and I were seeing those map choices and the map vetoes. Cyril made a very interesting pick for map number two. Yes, uh, we're actually going to hop into Turbo Cruise, and that's, of course, the map with the slow zones, the infamous slow zones in the middle of the map. And it's overall a map that we haven't seen super often in this matchup. I do think it's a really good map for some potential Nidus play. Uh, obviously, Swarmos Nidus can be very powerful on this map. It's a very big map. There's a lot of very good locations for it. I mean, I kind of lost my words over here, Robbie. Like, I'm thinking <laughs> about what everything that happened. I felt Cero had a very strong uh, mid-game. I think he had a pretty decent start. Like, yeah, he lost a couple of workers here and there, but... That was odd, man. Like, I'm actually, like, yeah. I'm sitting here in, in minor disbelief. Sure, it's only the first game of a best of five, but, I mean, 170 supply. And a okay, he spent most of his bank, but still, you know, there was <laughs> plenty to work with. Yeah. I'm not going to lie, Roddy. If I was at home like one, some of our wonderful viewers, I'd probably be rewinding the VOD, looking how things were going, but we are moving into game number two, and we have no time to waste. Turbo Crew is going to be map number two, Cyril's Choice against this young man. Down here in the bottom left-hand corner of the map, sitting up 1-0 in this series, he is Team Maker's very own Showtime. You'd be reminding, uh, rewinding the VOD. I'd be typing a Monka S in the Twitch chat. That's, <laughs> that's, I think, what I would be doing. On the right top side of Turbo Cruise, we're looking at the main base. The man who left game one in a rather surprising moment. Representing ends, it is Settle. Got that early probe scout looking to block this hatcher. It was so funny because, yeah. you know, one of my favorite things about coming to these offline events is talking with the players and watching them watch games. 
And one of the funniest things that I think I've heard today was Scarlet saying, yeah, when I play on the like games on the ladder and stuff, if my hatchery just gets blocked, I actually just leave the game because I think I'm so far behind. <laughs> I'm like, really? Is it that bad? There's obviously some downsides. And Showtime will still be happy that he's been able to force out the further away hatchery. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of Zergs also like to all in after this. That's mm -hmm. like one other response. They might not just leave, but they'll be like, yeah, okay, I'm really not in the mood to lose drones later on and mm -hmm. lose drones that are bouncing from base to base. And obviously, you know, one of the main things that makes this bad for Zerg is not just that it's a little bit harder to connect everything by creep, but it's also that the moment the main base is saturated, which is r uh, right now, normally you want to start transferring these drones to your yep. natural. Then normally it takes two and a half, three seconds before those drones start mining now they have to go all the way to that base at 12 o'clock and you know that's five six seven seconds so this is kind of a snowball effect every single drone you make will start mining a little bit later and this is why a lot of zergs truly despise uh, these kind of starts where the natural gets blocked by the probe absolutely I mean if you consider all the drones that get transferred around yeah. like these and the additional ones that'll be rallied on out I mean that is easily an extra 100 150 minerals that could have been mined and you are just further behind. So, Serral gonna put up with it for now. He doesn't really have too many other choices. This is not a ladder game. You could just lose or leave like Scarlet did. Uh, well, after that game, well, <laughs> got my <laughs> Okay, you know, you, you do have me questioning it. But I think you only get one of those in a yeah, best of yeah, five, yeah. Roddy. Yeah, I assume so. I highly doubt that we're gonna see more of that, so I'm just gonna let it go. I mean, sure, things weren't great, but it's definitely a little bit flabbergasted. That's just the way it is. We'll see how Cerro bounces back here on Turbo Cruise with speed more than halfway done. It's going to be a Stargate opening once again. Showtime might think like, well, you know, in the previous game, it really didn't go that great for me, and I ended up winning the game. That's quite a few links, by the way. Now, that's a lot of links. Uh, yeah. Are you going to build drones now, or are you going to make way. even more links? What's it going to be, Cerro? Okay. Maybe it just feels like he needs all these links to keep these drones safe, because obviously this base is so far away. Mm -hmm. The two adapt opening does represent a lot of danger, so Cerro's just showing a lot of respect to it for now. Exactly. The uh, uh, Queens... Yeah, the Queens can't really join forces and try and push back those adepts as they normally would if it was mean and natural. Okay, so as Indy was showing us there as well, like Showtime showed the Phoenix when the Overlord was inside, the moment that the Overlord... See? Like, uh, yeah, for several, this looks like a Phoenix. Oh, well, um, it looks actually it looks like Maybe he got the now. tail end of yeah. it, yeah. But it was a Phoenix at first, and then it's like, never mind, I'm going for an Oracle. But it seemed like Sarah's picked up on it, because these spores are actually quite early. Maybe Shotan was a tiny bit worried as well by the amount of Zerklings he saw. For now, everything seems to be standard, but the fact that Shotan was able to force Zero to expand where he did, I'd say this is a pretty decent start for our German Protoss. Yeah, looks like a couple of these Lings are suiciding themselves into that wall, going down to the Adepts and the Stalkers. The Oracle comes on forward. That support card, like you said, is already done. One drone takes a tickle in. It's going to be uh, reporting that to its healthcare official and uh, saying, kind of want a little bit of money for that, but... He'll be fine. Quick, pretty quick uh, robo once again behind this. Now, obviously, guys, this is not Thunderbird. This is not one of those maps where Protoss can make one wall off and just go very safely up to three bases. This map is a little bit more wide open, so multi-prong attacks are going to be a lot more dangerous to defend, and you can't just drop that Nexus if you barely have any units, because this time you're not sitting behind a wall. So we'll see when Showtime decides to expand, or if he actually goes for one of those very heavy two-base plays. We can see that Cerro is also making adjustments, as this game he's building a Roachworn. We didn't see a Roachworn at all in the previous game. Yeah, Roachworn coming down at 35 drones. Of course, adding on a few more after that, but hey, double oracles might be able to find a queen over here getting there before the other two queens are there in time. And this time, he does get out with both of those oracles. Here's the War Prism and a Templar Archives being added on as well. I'm surprised the Lynx are not going for the probe there. I really feel that it would have been a very easy pickoff, but that's not going to happen in the end. Uh, I think the Adepts even canceled their shade, so they're still yep. pretty safely tucked in between those mineral patches. It's a quick prison follow-up. I love how those oracles really wanted the queen, got the queen, and then Shilton was like, ah, one more drone as well, pop. <laughs> and then he got out of there. He's going to try his luck one more time. I think he <laughs> wanted to drop a stasis trap there. Look at Cerro, by the way. That's eight roaches. Do we have a lair yet? No, right? Unless I completely missed it. No, nope, it's triple okay. hatchery. This is, this is some really, really mm. early roach production here for Cerro. And just 43 workers. He really wants to be able to do some big damage to Showtime. 
who is trying to get up that third base. It did just recently get started. It's going to be Immortals and Archons here. Yeah, that actually feels like it's on time, right? The Immortal and Archon mm -hmm. production, double Archon even. Now, it is going to be a drop, I think, because I think those Archons were warped in on the right side of the map, and they are now inside of this prism. So it's important that Showtime realizes what's going on, but he can obviously, of course, recall. Guys, make no mistake, this is very, very committed by Serral. If mm -hmm. this attack does not work out, Serral could be in an absolute world of danger, and this should be a massive tell to Showtime right now because mm -hmm. normally Serral is always ready. Serral wants to tie up the score here, but Showtime, even though he has no batteries yet, I'd love to see a battery here or two, immediately recalls the prism. Yep, and let me tell you something, Roddy. We have seen some miracle defenses happen when you have Immortals paired with a Warp Prism. So Showtime going to just pull back inside that natural expansion. The Warp Prism is there. He's unloading the Archons. Cybernax Core will get taken out, and Showtime will need to restart that at some point. Yep. But for now, it's just going to be probably Zealots warped in with Charge still not finished. I mean, oh, that was really cool, actually. He dropped the cross of Bow on that mm -hmm. stasis trap. I mean, now because he lost the Cyber Core, he only built one battery. That's it for now. Now he's forced to rebuild the core if he wants to get more batteries. But we do know as long as there's a War Prism and as long as there are Immortals, there is hope. Saro is still building units behind all of this, Ravi. He is so committed at this point. Yeah. Even after sniping off the third base, that alone is not enough damage. He is looking for more. He's getting a lot of damage done to one of these Archons. Showtime does pick it up toward the tail end of things. Another one of the gateways where the production is going to be taken out over here. Showtime sending the Oracles to the other side of the map. Showtime wants to kill drones, but I think he should have focused on defending instead. Uh, the Cross of Bows will take care of these force fields. That one battery is absolutely putting in some work, but will Showtime have enough units here in the end? Oh, Roddy, he has three Immortals in that War Prism, but there are so many lanes he has to get through first. The Archons low on hit points. One of the Immortals getting so low on hit points, but the War Prism does pick it up and save it. The Oracles come back home. They're starting to take out the Roaches and the Ravagers. There's no more lanes to buffer, but a few more are going to come forward. The Robo is so low on hit points, and it is going to go down. The Robo goes down, but one more Immortal pops. You're looking at four Immortals there with a little bit of Micro. I do think that Showtime should at least survive here. He did lose everything, though. The Immortals are not going to be good. That's a really good Cross of Bow, forcing a pickup on the back Immortals. One Immortal finally falls. The second one is so close to falling as well. He's getting so much damage done, but the shields are all off of these Immortals. He nearly loses another one. He's microing his heart out right now. He dodges the Corrosive Vials. Pearl's being pulled off the line to do a Citizen's Arrest on these Queens. Is it going to be enough? Showtime falling down behind in workers. These Immortals, one of them goes down. Uh, Showtime just has too much money during all of this as well, man. GG, Serral will tie up the score. But boy, oh boy, was that close. And I actually think Showtime misread it a little bit. I mean, he sent those oracles to the other side. Remember, I'm like, mate, this is massive commitment. Like, Serral really wants to kill you here. And Showtime is thinking about harassing. I think if those oracles are at home, they could have been very useful from time to time. I really feel that Serral was running low on units as well. And if he would have, like, the moment he saw all those units, dropped three or four shield batteries, mm -hmm. that's a different ball game. Even at the very end, he's like, ah, oh, I guess I'll build a void ray. But Showtime had eight, 900 minerals in the bank and that was a close hold. So imagine if he spends that money, builds extra batteries and keeps the oracles at home, I think it is a hold. Absolutely, and even just small little things that could have been adjusted. Of course, having the oracles back at home, but also if he had started up his Cybernetic Core a little bit faster, then he could have actually made some of those shield batteries or also just having the extra gateways because he did lose a lot of those at the front line. There are all these small little things that add up, especially with how close of a game that ended up being. But Serral still manages to take that game and it's going to tie up this series one to one. I'm, I'm pretty shocked so far about both of these games. For Serral, after he's down 0-1 to put it all on the line like that, sure, if he drops that <laughs> map, he's down 0-2. He's not eliminated yet, but that is a risky call. And this Robo was actually pretty quick. I think that Serral was hoping for another Phoenix Triple Oracle, but that mm -hmm. wasn't it, right? This time the Robo was very quick. I think that that could have gone so wrong for the Finnish Phenom. And if he goes down 0-2, then it's going to be one hell of a mountain to climb because Showtime has been playing six StarCraft so far in this tournament. But one thing is for sure, after two games, we've got a semifinals on our hands. All right, we're moving into game number three, tied up series. Let's see who can reclaim that lead as we see up here in the top right hand corner of the map, the blue Protoss player from Team Makers. Put your hands together for Showtime.
We've got a very passionate crowd over here in Ukraine. Loving it's actually it. getting quite late, but all of these seats are still taken. People still really feeling it, watching these games, enjoying it in the left bottom side of New Repugnancy. Representing ends, it is Serol. Even starting to see some people just standing up in the back and everything, not having enough seats. So they're just looking for anywhere they can watch these amazing games, these titans clash in this game of StarCraft. And Roddy, we have yet another normal opening coming out from both of these players so far. I just want to note that while, of course, that series of Cyril versus Neve has absolutely restored my faith in Cyril's late game PVZ, mm -hmm. I have to say throughout this tournament and even just the past couple of weeks, I do feel like Cyril, a lot of his wins, a surprising number of wins have come off of that kind of early game aggression, similar to that last game. And I, mean, I have it's to wonder. Maybe he's playing into his own reputation a little mm -hmm. bit, right? Because more and more people start cutting corners against Cyril. Like, I know yeah. a lot of people at home sometimes is like, why don't pros just do X, Y, Z versus Cyril, you know? Why don't you do something crazy? And for a while, everybody's playing normal. And then at one point, they're like, well, you know, if Cyril likes to play late game, if he likes to defend, if he just likes to outplay us, let's cut corners. And people started cutting more and more corners against him. And I think eventually Cyril started to get a little bit fed up with it. And he's like, well, if you guys want to play this game, we're going to sprinkle in a few more all-ins, right? Because obviously Cyril is the greatest and Cyril is capable of outplaying anyone. You know, uh, there's only so many corners you can overcome before your opponents just start getting way too greedy and get away with way too many things. So I think that's kind of Cyril's way in keeping the competition honest. Yeah, staying unpredictable and making sure that you don't just get hard countered <laughs> and allow your opponents to just get away with huge leads to overcome sometimes that skill differential. This is cool, by the way. Twilight Council opening by Showtime. Now we'll keep a close eye on it if he's going to drop a Robo very quick as well. Because this is one of these maps where once in a while we see some of those resonating glaives openings. Now that we do have the Robo, so maybe this is just the traditional Dark Templar opening. We'll keep a close eye if it's a Tree Gate or a Four Gate. But I really hope that Showtime throws in one of those glaives openings as well. I do believe that some of those can catch Serral off guard as well if Serral doesn't sacrifice an Overlord, which he doesn't always do. Yeah, Showtime being a little bit more transparent this game by going for the Stalker first as opposed to the Adept openings that we've seen time and time again from the usual Stargate opening. So just a single Stalker and not even a full wall just yet. Those Lings are still not going to feel safe trying to dive too far in and it is going to be that Dark Shrine opening for the DT drop. Yep, now there are a couple of variations. There's obviously the traditional one with the four gateways where you can warp in 40 Ts at a time. Sometimes Protoss players will try to just warp in or walk in with the Dark Templars and try to snipe something. But there's also the three gate variation which hits a tiny bit quicker. And then obviously the downside of this is that you can only warp in three Dark Templars so you can't get the immediate double arc on, but maybe you can get some more success with your Dark Templars. Yeah, some of my favorite math that actually comes to comes into effect is if you dive in on the lair, if you get the first swipe off with those DTs on a lair and an Overseer has not morphed in, mm -hmm. you will guarantee the kill on that lair. With before four or three? With four. Okay. So three does mean you don't really have those kind of small little opportunities. There's a lot of little math that comes into play with the difference of that one extra unit. So. We'll see. I only saw, I think, a couple of gateways being added. Yeah, on no spore here. crawlers yet. I mean, obviously, the lair is close to finishing up. Mm -hmm. It was a very, very That's fast lair. That's a lot of links, by the way. So it seems like Sarah has a pretty good read on this. I think he kept a close eye on the prism as well. Mm -hmm. Let's see if Showtime is going to split them up or keep them together. No, he's just going to run in. Spore crawl is morphing. Overseer is morphing Ooh. as well. Indy, where is that Overseer morphing? All right, on the south side of our screen. So, I mean, it's, oh, can he get it surrounded? That would be massive for Sarah. You oh, saw that body blocking. He's yeah. blocking the invisible unit. He's surrounding the invisible unit as well after it's being revealed. And at this point, I do like what Showtime is doing here, though. He's leaving one behind, and he's going to harass with one. So at least this is causing quite a bit of lost mining time. Yeah, and the big thing over here is that, of course, he's going to be able to keep two of the DTs alive, but also just by splitting them up, like you were saying, Roddy, he knows there's only one Overseer, so all I have to do is be able to dodge out of the way of the Spore Crawler and the Overseer. And the Spore Crawler, not really so mobile. And now we can always morph them into an Archon, warp in two more Dark Templars, get two more Archon. Oh, what are you doing, mate? Oh, uh, perhaps a little bit, bit of nerves. Yep. He's going to take a look at it. So he's already building Immortals at home. 
Should Maxi not going up to three bases yet? Maybe he just wants to play it safe. Maybe a little bit terrified as well after what happened in that previous game. But there we do see a forge, so at least Showtime is preparing for the next phase of this game. Yep, and here we go. Oh. The War Prism Harass is going to be continuing forward. But as all those roaches are coming out, we also see that Spire started up there for Serral. That's actually going to be hard to scout, right? Do we have a sentry at all? I don't. I didn't no, see a sentry. because he opened up with the stalker first, and then he added on two adepts later on to help yeah. try and take that third base. But then it was just straight into the DTs. Well, that spire is halfway oh, there done. Are the, there are the sentries. That now. was an observer, yeah, but that's going to take a little while before that hallucination is ready. The archons came home, and that one observer was actually following the prism. Those are some good force fields. Harold really eager to pick up that probe. But it's not going to work out this time. But Serral's okay with all of this because he's keeping Showtime busy. And surprise, surprise, there is a Spire going up in the back of the main base. And I'll tell you, Ravi, if the Spire is done and you haven't seen it yet as a Protoss, that is very, very bad news. Because what does Showtime have right now? That's good against defending Mudas. Yeah, the Archons in the Prism. That's it. And even then, you have to be very careful with your War Prism. Yeah, the big problem with the Archons in the War Prism is that it is not as mobile as the Mutas. And if you are just using the War Prism to try and chase them down, oftentimes the Mutas, like you said, will actually just focus down that War Prism. You lose the mobility, and sometimes, in a worst case, you can even sometimes lose the Archons. So right. you got to be careful here, because if they dive on top of this Prism, recalling is probably not going to save it. So Showtime needs to keep his eyes wide open. That is a good scout and I think that's going to give at least Showtime the heads up that the Mudas are coming. He should be able to see the Spire. He should be able to see one or two Mudas see hatch. see shield battery already getting or finishing yeah. up right now. So if that's in a middle line, it's going to help out wow, substantially. He's, he's just going to attack. I mean, I'm not sure if that's going to work out. I mean, obviously, Mudas not great in straight-up fight, but from this point on, Cerro is going to build nothing but Roaches, Ravages, and Zerglings, and this is already putting a lot of pressure on Showtime. Oh, wow. Showtime's move-out is going to have to do tremendous amounts of damage. Already losing 9, 10 workers on the other side of the map. Showtime is pushing on in. These Immortals have got a lot of work cut out for them. He needs some good forest shields, and he's starting to back up. He's using all of his warpins defensively, Roddy, so he can't actually reinforce his push. Yep, I mean, that obviously makes that this push is not going to be very good anymore. Now Showtime 16 works, but he recalls. Doesn't get everything, actually. Uh, these Archons, I don't know if the Link on is high enough to trap it, but these Mutas have already done quite a bit of damage. They're going to get a few more probes over here. Serral is really creating a magnificent advantage for himself in this game. Already six workers are being picked off more by those Mutas. The War Prism does join forces with those Archons that were on the retreat. The Immortals also come forward. The Mutas trying to get some more damage done. The Shield Battery is nearly out of energy. The Archons doing a great job of staying alive over here. And this is going to get pushed back. The Archon has to be careful about over chasing here. But look at this. Serral already killing so many workers. Showtime down to just 42. Yep, Showtime is rebuilding them three at a time though, so at least he's trying to hang in there. Blink is close to finishing up. That's going to make his life a little bit easier. But I think that Sarah is more than happy with what these Mudas have accomplished. He's going to make five more, actually. He had quite a bit of money in the bank. I was wondering what he was going to spend it on. But there is no additional tax. So even though this is looking pretty disastrous for Showtime, if Showtime gets a big army, I don't know if he's going to get there, but if we do get 160, 170, supply of Immortal Archon Blink Stalker, there is absolutely some hope for the German Toss here because we all know that Roaches and Ravages, eventually, they will start falling off. Yeah, we're starting to actually see plus one melee being added on here for Serral, so he's going to start adding in a lot more links to the composition. He's getting up the Baneling Nest as well, so starting to round things out a little bit as he also finally establishes that fourth base. Is it yeah, it's I mean, it's not going to get in there, right? No, but it's scouts that A, that hatchery is not taken yet, and B, it sees that a few more Mutalists have been created. So that's actually nice information to have. Now, obviously, there is a fort base going up on the left top side. But, like, the, the army of Showtime, if it keeps getting bigger, like, I really don't want to count him out of this game yet. Like, he has taken a lot of damage, but he's only down eight workers, and he's working with superior units. Archons and Immortals are better than Roaches and Zerklings. So, yes, it hasn't been going great, but there absolutely Ooh. is some hope. And now with all of these Blink Stalkers, I don't think he should take that much more damage from the Mutalisk. Doing a great job, and the Blink Stalkers are oftentimes considered these temporary measure versus a lot of Mutalisk harassment, but... 
so far, ever since the earlier attacks, he's actually been doing a good job of fending them off so, uh, with just the Blink Stalkers. And now we actually even have a couple more DTs being uh, warped in right now, hopefully for some harassment, or is it just going to be for more Archons? Just I hope an Archon. That, I hope that Chotem doesn't move out, because Serral yeah. is absolutely planning on attacking him, and obviously defending is in general a little bit easier than attacking. Charge is almost done. I don't know if we have a lot of static defenses, but a few extra batteries would be super useful here, because we all know what Archons can do against Bane Links, especially Ooh. if they're backed up by batteries. Now, like, Serral's maxed out, and Serral has a composition. I think he's just waiting for Bane Link speed and maybe plus one melee, and then he wants to go for it. These mutas might actually cause the biggest debate ever yep. because Cyril is drawing the entire Stalker army over into oh the far goodness. corner of the main base. And guess what, Roddy? The entire oh. rest of the army for Cyril is starting to move forward. But that ramp is a dangerous spot, so Cyril's going to try and so move many around. Banes. 52 banelings. We don't really have those batteries, but maybe the force fields can save the day. Ravager is going to try and knock down these force fields, allowing these banelings to come crashing on forward. The sentry is getting taken out. The rest of them out of energy. And Showtime is looking oh. desperate in his ways to defend this push. The stalkers are coming in from the main base where the mutas have kept them busy but is there going to be a little bit too much the bailing count is certainly starting to run dry yeah the bailings were a bit indecisive i'm actually kind of surprised he didn't just crash into it there there are still a couple of mutas as well i thought it was just going to be over but showtime well showtime is still going to tap out gg after Serral still up 60 supply there, even though Showtime still had some stalkers, I mean, he was probably going to lose a few more probes there. That was just a really, really strong game by Serral, though. I think especially mm -hmm. how he kept Showtime busy, how he kept the Spire hidden, the way that he handled the initial DTs from the Prism. Excellent performance by the Finnish Zerk. Yeah, as much as we were kind of praising Showtime for making a lot of stuff happen toward the later end of that game, he was playing from behind, like you said, from that earlier harassment with the Mutalus, as well yeah. as the shutdown on that DT opening. So Showtime now going to be sitting down one and two in a series that he actually started up one and zero. And Cyril, one game away from that grand final appearance yet again. 52 bailings there. 52. Uh, sometimes you look at that army and then suddenly it's like, is this some cinematic? You know, is this meant to promote <laughs> the game or something? Because like you look at all these swarm units running up those ramps. And I, I do think that if Showtime maybe would have seen this coming a tiny bit quicker, then maybe you, you get a couple of random batteries, right? The batteries between your second mm -hmm. and your third base, they can be very useful because then sometimes you can have an Archon or your Immortal soak up a lot of these banes. You can jogger them to the back. But yeah, Saral just created a big lead for himself with all that Muda Harass. And the in the stalkers, end, it was just... The stalkers in the main base also, there yeah. was at least 15, 20 stalkers that were still sitting in the main base that weren't there for the entire beginning of that fight. So I, I'm totally with you that if he had had just a little bit more advanced notice, maybe he could have got that army in position in time. Serral looking for his seventh straight WCS finals, not including the GSL versus the world, not including the global finals, just when it comes to these circuit events. Of course, four out of four in 2018 made the finals of winter. Didn't win that one, but it was a little bit different. It was played in the studio, a lot of it was online. He won spring, now he's one map away of making it to the finals once again in WCS summer. Well, we're going to be starting up here in the top left-hand corner of the map, top of the blue Protoss player, the German from Team Makers. He really needs your energy. He is Showtime. And in the right bottom side of King's Cove, we're looking at the main base of our Finnish Zerk, the man who just seems unstoppable in this game. It is Zero. The sick thing about Cerro is that he also wins the events outside of the WCS circuit. He's like, home story <laughs> cups, those are fun to win. GSL vs. the world last year, that was really cool to win. Global finals, I'll take that one too. And Road to $1 million in esports earnings, Roddy. <laughs> Road to $1 million. I mean, if he just keeps on winning, he's going to get there by the end of the year for <laughs> sure. It is absolutely ridiculous what he's showing us and the way that he's showing it as well. It is not, you know, just a couple of tricks. He's so good at adapting. And I think one of the best suits about or uh, futures about Serral is honestly that he seems to learn so quickly. He loses against the strategy. Somebody else tries it doesn't lose against it anymore. He's so good at realizing where things went wrong and making sure that he doesn't make the same mistake twice. And I honestly think that's the main reason why he's so incredibly consistent. Because of course, his micro, his macro, all of the basic elements, Serral doesn't really have a true weakness. But on top of that, he's so incredibly good 
when it comes to learning from losses. Yeah, I really have to emphasize that, Roddy, because it is such a difficult thing to be consistent in a game like StarCraft. StarCraft is one of those games that receives patches. Sometimes you'll have some good things or bad things come your way. There are new maps that change the yep. way you have to play the game. New metas develop all the time. Every couple of weeks you see developments and Cyril keeps up with all of it and retains that ability to pull out the wins in the end. It is phenomenal. It is unheard of in the non-Korean scene to be this good. And on top of that, he is by far and away the most broadcasted player, right? Because he always wins. <laughs> he always makes it to the final, which means he plays an insane amount of games. In Challenger, he's always the most broadcasted player as well. There is so much information out there for everyone to work with, yet it seems to not bother him too much. And yes, he'll drop a couple maps here and there. It is absolutely astonishing how consistent Cero has been and how invincible he looks. By the way, no gimmicks. He's not there yet, Ravi. He's absolutely not there yet. In the grand finals, there is a young, very eager Italian kid waiting and that managed to defeat him not once, but twice before in WCS Winter. So it has happened before. I also remember a funny conversation. Of course, Rainer and Cero did play against each other in WCS Spring. Cero was able to win that one, three to nothing. But there was a little conversation in the players' lounge where Rainer walked up to Sarah and he's like, next time, I'll get you. And Sarah said, okay. <laughs> 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 that was about it, but... You, you can know. try. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, let's not count Showtime out yet. Showtime has played, honestly, the best StarCraft I've seen him play in a very long time. I've loved watching the German toss this tournament, and I hope that he can send it to Game 5, because that would be a joy for all of us. Without a shadow of a doubt, Roddy. We do have that Phoenix first opening here from Showtime. He's adding on the Oracle afterwards. You were talking about how much he does seem to love those three Oracle openings. Mm -hmm. I would say so far he hasn't gotten as much value from a lot of the Oracles as he would have liked, or as he has versus other Zerg players in the previous games that he's played. But Maybe this time you'll be able to make a little bit more work. Every single time you learn a bit more about how that opponent's defense is going to happen. The eye tracker is actually incredibly inaccurate because it can't keep up with Cyril. <laughs> 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 Just kidding, Toby. I know it's trying, yeah. but uh, it's, uh, like Cyril doesn't stream a lot, obviously. I mean, he, he doesn't seem to enjoy it super much, mm. but he has done a couple of streams in the past. And if you watch him play, it's actually it's sick. Like It, it feels bending. like he cues the comments up before I truly see what, it, what he has done. And of course, they are, he's not the only fast player. I don't want to make it seem like this is a unique Cyril thing, but it is absolutely pretty crazy to watch him play. All right, we do have the Twilight Council follow-up coming on out, additional oracles being made, and Cyril does have a decent number of lings out on the map and are going to be looking to poke into that third base. But the oracle is forced to expend a bit of energy just to make sure that those adepts don't get picked off and surrounded. Mm -hmm. Showtime already working on a very creative wall there. Oh, well, he does have the Robo and the Twilight. I have the feeling that if Showtime truly wanted to go up to three bases, don't you think he would have done it already, Ravi? I think so, Roddy. I'm starting to feel some funny yeah. mind gamey vibes over here from Showtime. Me we'll too. see if he plays this out and fakes that third entirely here. Yeah. Resonating glaives on the way, Roddy. Yeah. I, I feel like he really would have thrown down his third base by now if he was planning on it. Yep, <laughs> I like it. I mean, he is dropping it right now, but obviously a lot of the uh, initial investment went into the gates, went into the robo, goes into this upgrade. Now there is a Roach win this game, but that's 11 drones, by the way. We'll keep a close eye on 44 that. 44 workers oh my God. for Ro Showtime. Yeah, cyril has got to stop building drones right here, right now, by the way. Otherwise, he's going to be in a lot of trouble because Glaives aspire as well. Cyril, actually, you're going to need some Roaches, my friend. Oh, my God. Showtime is selling this so well, and he's already going to be starting off with a bit of damage, mostly happening on the Spore Crawler, though. Now he's going to start picking off a couple of these drones, but he loses one of the Oracles, the other Oracle, Beaten and battered. He's going to have a hard time getting out of there until those shields regen, unless he wants to use a recall. The adepts making their way forward a little bit preemptively, but here are all the adepts revealed oh, immediately. <laughs> Cyril should know what's happening. Oh, but Cyril's kind of supply block. Look at that. 88 out of 90, 200 minerals in the bank. He's going to have to wait for those overlords to finish up. This is going to be really hard to hold. I mean, obviously, queens are tanky. Queens can buy sometime. There was a stasis trap in the main base as well, but there is a lot of potential here for Showtime. It's a big investment. 15 adepts is a massive investment, so Showtime is going to need to do a lot here, but he absolutely has the potential to do a lot. All right, the Roaches are in very low numbers right now, and they are going to cancel that shade. They feel like they can get more damage done over here. They picked off two of these drones. He's still not shading mm. out. There is the shade finally coming, but a couple of these Adepts already getting picked off. The Lings doing some damage. Oh, Stasis Trap catches a lot of these drones, and 
Showtime is forced to retreat. That still is not the damage he was looking for. No, I'm with you. That's absolutely not the damage that he was looking for. And I really think that if he lets that first shade finish up, obviously it's very easy for us to say because we have no fog of war. Showtime doesn't necessarily yeah, know smart. what's in the natural of Serral, but if he would have shaded away from those queens, there was very, very little to work with for Serral. And those adapts could have absolutely rampaged the natural. Nidus Worm being added on here for Serral. And what? with all these roaches he's been making, if he ever feels like there's, oh, he canceled the Nidus Worm and remakes it Stasis. in vision range of Showtime. Stasis Trap is going to get caught this time. So not going to lose out on that mining time. But with so many roaches being added on, if these adepts truly get pushed back, Showtime is going to have to be very careful with his defense because you invested into all these adepts. That does cut into your defensive gateway production. Yep, that's a few more adepts going down. But obviously, we did have that robot, though. Do we have any more to out already? We one or should two? have one, yep. too. Yeah, one or two. I mean, oh, I'll, he's I, moving out, though. No, I don't want them to be moving out, especially not against the potential Nidus network as well. We still have quite a few queens alive from that early game. Saro is doing all of this of 60 drones, so it's obviously a strong economy. But by now, Showtime actually has more workers and not a, a nice stasis. stasis trap connected in the main base. I wonder, is Saro going to commit with his Nidus play? I mean, seven Ravages, five Roaches, 14 Links, and plus one. Mm. Saro absolutely it's wants overlord. to get good damage done. Oh, no. There I mean, it Shilton, is. Him. Does he see it? Can he warp in something? in vision range, but I think he's busy with the Oracles he's and the engagement in the center of the map. We see the Ravager grows about trying to knock down these four seals, and he's already closing the distance. Forget the Nidus Worm, Roddy. I feel like Saro's already winning the engagement in the center. I'm not going to forget the Nidus Network because there are Zerglings in the main base. More Nidus is going up as well. The the links in the main base already starting to pick off a couple of probes, but the oracles are there to save the day, so that's actually kind of nice. Serral still trying to spread Showtime thin. Showtime still under a lot of pressure. Where are the immortals? The are immortals, they all gone? They're gone. They got picked off, and now we end up seeing the Ravagers claiming victory for Serral. Three to one. Another grand finals appearance for our king. All he does is win, but he's going to go up against the man that did stop him in WCS Winter and the man that perhaps made him work harder for it than he ever had to do in any other final, and that is Raynor. So we are going to get ready for one hell of a ZVZ, but Saro does get the job done once again against one of the very best Protoss players in Europe. Well, the best Protoss in Europe. It was a fun one. It was a confusing one, I'm not going <laughs> to lie. But in the end, another stunning performance by the Finnish Phenom. Great showing there by Showtime, but now we get to hear from the man on the stage once again. It's Sue. Thank you very much, guys. Congratulations, Cyril. Yet another Grand Finals for you, and in fact, it's your seventh WCS Grand Finals, just in case you were counting. Uh, and it's funny enough, now that there's no protest left, I feel comfortable bringing this story up because on day one, I asked you about the different matchups, and you told me that you weren't a fan of ZVP, and in fact, I think the word that you used was that you felt your ZVP was garbage. And yet, you defeated two very strong protest players to make it to the Grand Finals, so what do you have to say about that? Well, obviously it's not complete garbage, but <laughs> from my standards, from my standards, it's not the best. But I think this series I got some got some lucky lucky streaks and uh, I should have probably lost some of these games, but yeah, that happens to the best of us and uh, I can I can change the fate fate of my how the game so. What was it like going up against Showtime after you took down Neeb, who obviously we talked about how he had such amazing uh, PvZ? Uh, I, like I said, I was a bit more worried about Neeb, but actually Showtime played very good. The first game was very good by him. I, I felt he was in a pretty good spot after the start, after getting like two oracles against the three oracle builds. So I think he played a very good macro game there. Also maybe a bit too aggressive since you need to be very very careful with the run by some warp gems. So yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm going to say I went to this match very confident, but I ended up all in every game pretty much, <laughs> so I don't know. Well, it still worked out. You're moving forward in clean 3-1 victory. And now, in the Grand Finals, you're going to be facing Raynor, who you have a lot of history with. You've actually faced him in the Grand Finals of a WCS before. I believe it was Montreal last year. You took him down 4-3. But more recently, you were the one to knock him out of spring 3-0. So he seems to be very, very eager for that chance of revenge. What are your thoughts on that 17-year-old? Uh, he can be as eager he, as he wants, but... <laughs> Not gonna change too much, I think. <laughs> hey, he says it's not gonna be enough. We'll see if that's the case. Congratulations once again, Cyril, in the grand finals. Name a better duo.